dealt with inclusive development from many different angles and perspectives. So um, what I would like to do is um, I want to begin by introducing each of the panelists and then I would like to launch um, the discussion um, using um, research that is currently underway at the OECD on inclusive innovation for development. So let me start to my right. We have um, Rohan Samarajiva. He is um, founding chair and CEO of Learn Asia, an ICT policy and regulation think tank um, that is active across emerging economies in um, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Um, before setting up Learn Asia, um, Rowan was a team leader at the Sri Lanka Ministry for Economic Reform, Science and Technology, um, where he was responsible for infrastructure reforms, um, including uh, the participation in the design of the East Sri Lanka Initiative. Maybe he can tell us a bit more about this in a second. So then we have um, Siri Oswald. Um, she is a senior program officer in the Global Libraries Initiative at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, where she is currently um, working on increasing public access to information technology and to promote um, public libraries. Um, before she joined um, the Gates Foundation, um, Siri worked in Washington um, for CRDF Global, which is a not-for-profit organization um, that's focused on promoting peace and prosperity through international scientific collaboration. And she told me that she's been in Azerbaijan um, for four or five times, is that correct? So she, she has an extensive background on uh, emerging um, country and development issues. So to my right, um, we have Henriette Esterhuisen. Henriette is um, the executive director of the Association for Progressive Communications um, that was established in 1990. Um, prior to joining APC, um, Henriette was executive di director of one of the APC members, um, which is um, Sagunet, an internet service provider and training institution. Then um, to my left, um, we have um, Wesley Cheng. Wesley is um, director at Huawei Consulting, and there he's responsible for the regions of um, Central Asia and the Caucasia region. So basically everything that is going um, to Mongolia, he just told me a second ago. Um, he's, um, he has an extensive background um, in the private sector, so his past experience um, include working at Smartphone Mobile and BT Asia. Rachel is the Chief Operations Officer at Acrinic, um, and she's responsible for um, the development, the implementation, and the management of the budget. And prior to joining Acrinic, Anne Rachel was um, the Manager of the Regional Relations at ICANN, um, where she was the primary link um, to the African community. So welcome to all of you. Um, we also have Alice Munia, but she's still not a workshop and might join in a second. Now I would like to quickly introduce the topic. I'm afraid I have to go over to the laptop. Okay. So um, like the first question is, why do we organize this workshop and why do we care about um, inclusive innovation for development? So um, let me start with uh, the term of innovation. We, we really like the word innovation at least OECD, but um, some people say that's pretty much of a buzzword. So um, now why does innovation matter? Well, innovation matters because it helps drive social benefits and economic growth. And any time um, these days um, that you say the word growth, um, policymakers will be really excited um, because that's what they're looking for desperately at the moment. Um, but 
innovation can also be unbalanced if only certain members of the society have tools to innovate, um, if only certain segments of the population are benet benefiting from innovation. So um, this is why it's so important to focus on how innovation can be inclusive and how it can be applied effectively to development. Now, in the area of the internet and related ICTs, um, we find innovation tools at several layers. Um, one important layer is um, the infrastructure and the waste layer. So um, one, the networks, uh, and second, um, the devices that operate on those networks. And what we can see is that um, if you look at the chart, significant progress has been made to equip people around the world um, with the power of communication. So, namely, the mobile phone. So, um, at the year 2000, we had... Could you please switch this to... Perfect. Now you can see it. Thank you very much. So, um, at the year 2000, there were just over 700 million mobile subscribers, um, but that number, in only 11 years, grew up to 6 billion mobile subscriptions around the world. So we saw a tremendous growth. Um, so that, that means that the world has now much better access to mobile phones, and these, of course, then can be leveraged to support innovation throughout the economy and society. Now, the interesting question is, um, how this has impacted the digital divide um, that we've seen a couple of years ago. So what you can see on this slide is the number of mobile subscriptions per 100 inhabitants. And um, the blue line is the developed world. And the green line is the developing world. And you can also see that only a couple of years ago, um, we had a digital divide. This was in 2006, 2007. And you can see that in recent years, like from 2010 on, this digital divide is actually narrowing. So very good news on this side. And if you think of it, um, mobile phones are a key part of the innovation puzzle um, because they're increasingly viewed as portable computers. So in fact, we have a long time uh, used the term PC to refer to personal computers, but maybe we have to rethink it, and we have to term it pocket computer in future. And this is a chart um, from OECD countries, um, but what you see here is um, that um, mobile subscriptions are overtaking um, fixed broadband subscriptions. Um, and mobile subscriptions first surpassed fixed line descriptions in 2009, and by now um, we can see that there are roughly two mobile broadband subscriptions for each fixed line subscriber in the OECD area. And in fact, um, this ratio is significantly higher outside the OECD in emerging and developing countries um, because fixed ne line networks either have not been widely adopted, um, too pricey, or not very successful. Now, um, when we look at the digital divide for mobile broadband, this is a very interesting graph. So you remember the graph I just showed to you? This is the graph for mobile broadband subscriptions. And in fact, um, you see that for both the developing world and the developed world, our mobile broadband subscriptions are increasing. But what you also see is that um, in the developed world, this is taking place at a much faster pace than in emerging and developing countries. So here you see a clear digital divide, and the question will be, um, will this divide close? So will this curve just follow the other curve in a couple of years ago? Or is this digital divide increasing, actually? Now, um, the second interesting thing to look at besides infrastructure and devices are applications. So what do you do? with your devices, how do you do the internet, how do you use the internet, how do you do business. 
So, and what we could see in our report was that um, multiple new applications have developed in very important areas such as health, um, education, and agriculture. And what we also see is that, especially for the disadvantaged groups, main benefits mainly came from a better access to quality information that these people didn't have before. So at this stage, um, we're still um, in an area where the biggest lever is access to information and not so much um, what you do with more sophisticated applications. Now, in terms of challenges, um, we could identify two main challenges. First of all, um, project sustainability is not great. Um, that means that many applications um, that have been founded um, by foundations um, go out of business um, after, um, well, no money is, is any more left. Or we could also see that um, there are no sustainable business cases. So applications work at the beginning, um, but then um, fail and basically shut down. And the second challenge that we see is um, that it's very important to increase scale. So um, we found many applications that work like a charm for a small community. Um, but then the key question is, you know, how do you roll it out? How do you make it um, available for a larger group of people? Um, now, this leads me to the key questions for the discussion. Um, so the first key question is inclusion versus exclusion. Um, does the internet do related ICTs contribute to a more inclusive development or maybe to an exclusive development? Um, the second um, area um, that we would like to discuss is, OK, if we want to take action, what should we do? What are best practices? Um, what, what does work and what does not? And um, here we have a panel um, where um, people come from different regions, have different backgrounds, so it will be very interesting to bring those ideas together. And finally, what of course the OECD is interested in, what does that mean in terms of policy? What kind of policy do we have to develop um, in order to foster inclusive development? organizational innovation and inclusive uh, growth at the same time, if I could, and then try to drag in the World Conference on our International Telecommunications, if possible. Uh, I run uh, a think tank called Learn Asia, and we have been doing it for eight years. And in this eight years, we've done a lot of organizational innovation. I'm not going to be able to tell you all about it, but a little bit will come in here and there. Uh, basically, our thinking was that there were two base, two issues. One that, that Verena uh, referred to, which is too many pilot projects, too many little isolated initiatives that uh, were not sustainable and went out of business when the donor money went, uh, went away. And our analysis was that this was because the overall policy and regulatory environment, particularly in regard to the infrastructure, the, the ICT infrastructure was was problematic, was wrong. Um, just to illustrate this, lots of people have started little projects in Indonesia. Uh, but the real problem in Indonesia, according to us, was that lease lines were extraordinarily expensive. And nobody could really sustain the lease line payments that were being extorted from uh, the ISPs who had to provide internet service, and therefore who were not providing it at levels of quality or price that were appropriate. So we did context-specific, Indonesia and regional-specific research. And it took us a year or two, but we engaged with the government. 
uh, we used a line which said that the Indonesian lease line prices were 48 times that of India. So you can see we were using memes, we were using comparative data, we were using very context specific information, and we got the prices down. They were reduced by more than 50%. Now, I would argue that we have done more to bring uh, internet closer to the people of Indonesia than a lot of the people who, with all good faith, tried very hard and volunteered and did hard work on those various pilot projects that crashed and burned. Uh, but then we can debate this. Now, the issue is that we argue that if people have more access to internet, which is lower price, usually gets you more access, uh, they tend to be able to do more things, either as small businesses or as individuals, and that tends to contribute to inclusive growth. The macro studies, the correlations exist. So this is our contribution to inclusive growth. And this is just one story. We do this in a large number of countries. The question is, <coughs> we would not be able to do it without a whole series of organizational innovations. I went back to Sri Lanka in 1985 and spent two years there trying to do work like this. And I felt like a fish out of water because I had no access to prior work. I had no access to the literature. I was in trouble. And two years later, I packed up and went back to the United States to teach. Now, today, I don't even think about access to prior work because, in fact, my access to the policy-relevant literature from our region and from outside is actually much better than through one of the best libraries, university libraries that I had access to 10, 15 years ago. The gray literature is easier for me to get through the internet than through a library. I don't miss the library. I have, I pay for off prints. I do various things, but uh, we can do our work with this organizational innovation. We run a virtual organization. We have Skype conferences. We use uh, videos uh, that we download from the internet for our colloquia and training. We rely and use the internet all the time, and we couldn't function without it. Without us functioning, I would argue you wouldn't get cheap internet, and you wouldn't get inclusive growth. There's the linkage, right? Now, is there a danger facing us? Yes. That danger is called the World Conference on International Telecommunications. That is, certain people, certain interests, are proposing that we impose something called sending party network pays regime, which didn't even work for voice telephony, that they impose this on the internet. Bottom line is that whenever I or one of my researchers sends out a request to a server in another country, and when that server gives us a video or a big report, 4 or 5 MB report, that network would have to pay the network that I'm on a certain financial payment. Now, leave aside all the transaction costs and all that. That would make this a non-viable proposal. But I am making the request, and somebody somewhere else has got to pay the bill, which is quite illogical. Now. If this were to go through, there are two possible things that will happen. One is balkanization, which is that whole parts of the world will be cut off from access to certain kinds of content because it is too cumbersome, too clumsy, and we are not, we don't have enough purchasing power to, to make us attractive enough in an advertising-driven world. The other is that some of that content will have to move beyond, behind paywalls. Now, an organization like mine, which does funded research, might be able to get over, jump over the paywalls, but it would still increase our transaction costs considerably. And it would make the current organizational model that we have innovated uh, to contribute to using the internet and to contribute to inclusive growth uh, quite unviable, and we'd have to rethink all that, which is one reason why I oppose these ill-thought-out, ill-considered proposals to put the internet in a straitjacket. Thank you. So most people probably know the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation primarily for its work in healthcare, in polio and HIV AIDS, or in agricultural development or financial services such as M-PESA. 
or if you live in the United States for work in secondary and post-secondary education. But all of these elements have something in common, which is access to information, which is why the Gates Foundation has been funding work in public libraries for over 15 years, because we believe that access to information is crucial. As you said, you can't live without the internet. And I, the, the, the su sustainability issue and the scale issue you highlighted really strike a, a chord with me because it is specifically why the Gates Foundation has chosen to partner with public libraries. There are over 230,000 public libraries in the developing world alone. So that doesn't even count all the libraries that are in the developed world. These are 230,000 potential partners for development initiatives. These are 230,000 pre-existing institutions that have staff, that are trained, that are members of the community, that are trusted, and these are 230,000 places that are already receiving government funds. These institutions have received government investment already and just are not at the moment being used to their full potential. So we work in public libraries and with public libraries as partners for development efforts because we see this as an opportunity to maximize investments that governments are already making in development efforts. So when you talk about the networks and the devices, there's one other piece there that I think needs to be layered on, and that's how. How are people accessing these resources when that divide that was so nicely illustrated in the graph still exists? The divide may be narrowing, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. And so we really need to be investing in other opportunities for these development efforts to take place. And we see public libraries as actually a sustainable institution because of the government funding that's already been invested in them and because of the commitments you see at the local and national level. These are not institutions that have been created because a donor came in and decided to do a pilot project. These were institutions that existed before a donor ever arrived. And when you talk about scale, I think 230,000 represents a really nice scale and a scale that we should be maximizing in our work. So I'm excited to hear more, and I'll stop right there, but I just think that I want to champion public libraries as a solution to both of those challenges that you proposed. Um, thanks, thanks, Verena. Um, it's really interesting to, to, um, to launch right into the, the issue of, of pilots, but, but, and, I, and I will touch on that, but just to tell you a little bit more about what my organization does, AP Association for Progressive Communications, we address this issue of innovation and ICTs for development at, at two levels. On the one hand, at quite an application level, for example, we would be doing um, support with projects that involve women and small-scale agriculture, um, we have a lot of capacity building and developing and supporting ideas for using technology in their work. And, and on the other hand, we also work at the level of policy. And our policy analysis and, and research, which draws entirely on, on work of, of think tanks like Learn Asia, and we also work very closely with, with uh, Learn Asia's counterpart in Africa, Research IC, ICT Africa, works on two areas. Access, firstly, because the, the, the affordable incest, uh, access to infrastructure is really fundamental to, to innovation for development. But then we also work on policy that affects what people can do with that access once they have that. And that ranges from policy that impacts on um, uh, intellectual property, for example, copyright, as well as freedom of information, freedom of expression. Um, I think that you know what we also do with our, our policy work on access, we, we try to identify issues that are currently creating bottlenecks. So a few years ago, we worked on national broadband policy, and we worked in a few countries in Africa to try and, and, and create bottom-up pressure and advocacy from civil society and business in partnership with government to create more open approaches to the creation of national broadband, broadband, to get governments to understand they don't need to do it all themselves. What they need to do is to create an enabling environment for that infrastructure to be developed. And then we would also home in um, on an issue that we're currently working on, which is spectrum and particularly the digital migration process and how that has the potential for making more spectrum available for mobile broadband. And I think just a note on that, when I looked through your report, it seemed to me at times that there's an assumption that, that 
mobile broadband is about having smartphones at the other end, but in fact, um, in, in areas where there is no mobile, mobile broadband, mobile broadband is broadband for laptops, for servers. It, it's just it's the, it's the infrastructure we need. Um, um, but not to comment on the issue of, of, of pilots. You know, I think um, I always feel that there are three design flaws in in in, in ICT for development innovation. And, and this constant uh, problem that repeats itself, um, that upscaling doesn't happen and pilots, pilots fail. I think the first one is sequence, uh, and, and I think Ron touched on that. Unless you have the infrastructure uh, available, it has to be cheap enough and easy to get, then many of these initiatives are just not going to be sustainable. And I think what happened with the donor community and development agencies, there was a tendency to to, to implement and develop applications before the infrastructure environment was really ready for it to roll out. That's not necessarily a bad thing because one does learn a lot through that process. I think the second design flaw is an assumption, it, it, it really is just how the projects are designed. And I'm not an engineer, although I think I would like to have been one. <laughs> um, but there's an assumption that you, you develop something that works on a small scale, and if it works well on a small scale, you can then roll it out um, at a large scale, and actually that just doesn't often work out because when you design something to work on a small scale, you design it very differently from how you would design something that's intended to work at large scale. And I think this is something the business community understands. I don't think development agencies and the donor community necessarily understands this all that well. And, I, and then I think that the you know the third. Um, design flaw has been time frames. I think many of these pilots have just not been given enough time to work. And I think again here, I think the, the business community again is better at, at, at dealing with this. It's generally less risk averse, there's more of an understanding that failure is part of, of the innovation process and that a certain percentage of your, of your, your startups are not going to, to work. And I think in the donor community and the development community, there's very low tolerance for that. And just to think a model, just to end on what I think is a more effective model for us to think about, rather than upscaling, is replication. I think in ICT for development, often initiatives that can happen on a small scale or in the case of public access and libraries, work well in one library or one country can then really work well if you replicate it. But replication in other um, uh, sites or other places with customization, with change, with adaptation. And I think in our kind of innovation for development world, uh, uh, that's often a better model than simply going or assuming you can go from pilot to, to upscaling. And I'll leave it at that for now and come back later. Okay, so Henriette just mentioned that business to do the trick. So how to deal with scale and time frames. So I'm looking forward um, to hear the rest of your statement. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, IGF and thank you for Rena's invitation for me to uh, share on behalf of Huawei. Uh, before we go into uh, specifics, uh, I just look at the research. You talk about quite a bit about infrastructure uh, in terms of uh, international connectivities, in terms of submarine cables, in terms of uh, mobile broadband as a way to uh, bring broadband service to the uh, developing countries and uh, 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 and especially the, the less di disadvantaged uh, uh, communities. Uh, in that sense, I'd like to share a little bit of uh, my practical experience. Uh, when we think about infrastructure, there are uh, better ways and smarter ways uh, to implement in a more cost-effective way. Uh, just give you an example, the region I'm operating is Central Asia and Caucasia. Many of these countries are historical uh, linking to Russia. So even today, the most popular email address is .ru. Even though I'm sending an email to the guy next to me, he's uh, going to Moscow and then coming back. And many of these social networking uh, popular sites are also based in uh, Moscow. So I'm sending a, a, a photo sharing with my friends <laughs> in a local community, but the traffic's still going back and forth. But uh, building up infrastructure internationally is expensive. So alternatively, there's a smarter way, and some of the countries in this region start to realize 
they start to develop the uh, IDC data center and invite those uh, service providers to host the email servers, the social networking servers, in a uh, data center located locally. So the traffic does not need to travel all the way back and forth. So this is one way to uh, uh, get a better communication without uh, spending the wrong money. The other thing about uh, national broadband and very much linking to mobile broadband, uh, as shown in the chart, is uh, our view is actually um, a cost-effective uh, internet broadband in a country is a mix of uh, fiber, of mobile, of Wi-Fi, and even satellite. If you think of a, a, a so-called poor country or developing country, there are big cities there. There are lots of uh, uh, concentrated uh, economies where you will find uh, laying fiber is more cost effective than going for mobile. And uh, for small villages, if you have a village of 50 people, 100 people, what's the point to sell mobile phone? You can just go next door and knock on the door to call someone instead of this calling. I still remember this ad of National Geographic. When I call someone, I go to his room and call. <laughs> so, so in that case, um, a satellite uh, a network might be far more effective in terms of shared internet usage for education, for uh, uh, e-health. So um, our approach when we think of uh, uh, rolling our broadband network in a country, especially developing countries where we have huge experience, we believe infrastructure-wise it should be a mix carefully designed to optimize. Um, and then uh, the research report that I read also talk about uh, surface charge of broadband uh, uh, internet surface as a measurement of the affordability and see how popular that is. Uh, my real experience is uh, when we talk about affordability, it's not just the surface charge, it's the entire value chain, including devices. In many countries that I'm operating, uh, I found that one of the key barriers is not about the surface charge. Many of the telecom service provider telling me that, hey, I've rolled out a 3G network, but no one is using. Why? Because people cannot buy a phone. Uh, so when we think about, uh, especially internet phone, so when we think about how to uh, promote internet service, even to the disadvantaged people, not necessarily mobile is the answer, but it really depends on situa situations. So this uh, a little bit of sharing on the technology side, and then going back to the inclusion and exclusion of the impact of internet. Uh, Huawei has helped launch a um, national broadband network in many countries, and what we found that um, is definitely the benefit of such projects helping uh, those countries, especially the large scale projects, um, which uh, we found that is very useful. Um, Direct impact is actually job creation. If you think of, uh, uh, there are many research talking about different countries when they roll out huge internet infrastructure like that. Uh, the recent uh, report that I read is Germany take uh, 10 years to roll national broadband, but in the construction itself, you create 980,000 jobs uh, directly linking to that, and then it stimulate about 400,000 jobs because of the innovation and service applications. So job creation is a is a direct impact, um, and then um, there are uh, uh, many research report, including a research report by World Bank Economics, uh, saying that uh, uh, every 10 percent increase in broadband penetration leads to 1.5 to 1.3 percent growth in GDP. So there is a direct linkage between uh, broadband penetration and GDP. When I think of this, uh, the inclusion and exclusion, uh, I'm not just thinking within the society, the rich people and the poor people. It's also in international wise, there are some less advantaged countries uh, who we should help them to build up the uh, national competitive advantage, competitive edge. So uh, this kind of uh, internet projects, especially at national level, definitely can bring up uh, the national competitiveness uh, from a country perspective. Um, so that, I think, uh, is also to the uh, good point. And the last thing is very easy to understand is on the e-education and e-health uh, when we launch internet. Uh, just to conclude my, int uh, my introduction is uh, uh, when we talk about all these inclusions, 
what you realize is many of these benefits are not directly linked to any individual commercial entity. GDP uh, improve, what does that mean to Huawei or any telecom operator? Job creation, it has a, it has very minimal value for a purely commercial, but it's really serving the community, the country. Most of the countrymen is benefit. So this is why our view is um, for projects like this, it should be really lead and drive by the government who are um, having all these benefits. Uh, I'm not saying the government should do it, should put the money itself, but should take the leadership and structure the framework, which I think we will address uh, at the end of the, la uh, the third question. So government really play a very important role in bringing this forward. Uh, here I, I would like to finish by, by now. Thank you very much, Verena, and thanks to OECD for inviting me on this panel. Um, I, um, I'm here also as one of the representatives of uh, ITAC. ITAC is the uh, Internet Technical Advisory Committee at the OECD, and basically it's a collection of um, uh, technical organizations um, that uh, are, you know, that is composed with regional internet registries, um, people like ICANN, ISOC, and a few others that help to shape our policies in terms of looking at it also in, you know, when, when policies are done, as Verena was saying, um, what could be their impact if the, 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 the thinking about the infrastructure hasn't taken place. So we do believe that, you know, uh, and we see a direct correlation between the development of infrastructure, local content, and uh, economic growth. Um, infrastructure, one of the things that we do, for example, as um, um, regional internet registries, and I come from the African one, is um, today the distribution of uh, uh, the IP protocol version six. Um, it's not so, no longer such a, um, let's say, um, uh, innovative thing, but it is the one thing that would actually help us, you know, uh, bring up even more services and, uh, you know, things and um, uh, uh, whatever, you know, economic uh, growth we can see on the internet next. So this is one of the things that we're dealing, and when I take that one part exclusively in terms of uh, inclusion and exclusion, for example, you know, we can see its impact in terms of the development of the infrastructure. The development of infrastructure leads to also development of content when there is, and as um, um, Ariette was saying, uh, the, 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 the policies that are put together in terms of appropriation and use of IPv6 in, you know, countries are essential to make sure that, you know, the, this, this growth happens. So um, we definitely, you know, uh, this is one of the things that we've been working on related with that. Then uh, networks need to, as uh, Wesley was saying, to, you know, to be talking to each other, but also, you know, in talking to each other, what they do is that they bring the information, you know, the, the local information uh, to people. As some of us said here, the inform information is very important for people. So how do you make that information available? One. Second, how do you make it affordable? And third, how do you make sure that this is something that is really um, uh, uh, used on a daily basis uh, because there is you know, no latency, because the network is available 24-7, because you know, the, so the infrastructure is following on a regular basis. So, IXPs, the internet exchange points, the you know the IP addresses, uh, um, uh, the the DNS services in general in countries, and uh, of course things like um, you know having instances of um, uh, of root servers, which are which are some of the things that we're doing in helping the communities to install them, so that there is less latency in you know um, uh, reaching the information is something that is very important. And uh, um, you know we have um, we we have welcomed actually uh, uh, an OECD study on interconnection, 
uh, that has also been praised, for example, by the African Union. And uh, this is one of the things that is, um, it shows that, you know, when people realize what can be the benefit of this thing, then, you know, the policies follow. This is one study that was, um, you know, done by OECD, but is now being taken by other regions because it's really something that has shown that it is important to keep traffic local, to make it affordable, and to make sure that it's, you know, accessible to people. So that's really important for, uh, uh, and, and we have definitely, we welcome that one. Uh, we also um, have worked with, um, um, we, we are hoping that we will continue to actually work with the OECD on the global interconnection thing, because this is one of the, uh, the things that we've seen is at the crux of what Rohan was talking about earlier on in terms of what is going today into the ITRs, the International Telecommunication Regulations, you know, uh, making content content accessible, making sure that it doesn't cost more, you know, for those who are still not there. Because one of the things that we have to realize is that we still not that many on this internet thing, you know, compared to the many who are out there still not connected. So when we get there, funny enough, we were discussing yesterday that the, the next billion users are also going to be more of the talking users in terms of, uh, you know, the mobility of the devices that they have, but also because they come from emerging areas where people are less literate in the regular languages that we have today on these devices. So how do we make sure first that the, you know, that their languages are accessible on the internet? I was just on a panel on internationalized domain names and we can see that, you know, that is also, it's there, but it's still not being taken up um, as quickly as we thought it could if domain names were available in people's languages. You know, Korea, which is one of the best case studies, is still having issues. Why? Well, because the devices are not recognizing some of the applications, you know, that are on the, that, that are on the devices. So, uh, you know, your, your um, how do you say, your uh, mobile phone is not recognizing um, a browser that's um, uh, uh, information that speaks Arabic or that is written from left to, or right to left or from, you know, top to down. So these are all the issues that still, you know, need to, um, uh, to be worked on. So in taking action, of course, we talked about some of the things that have to be worked on by the browser industry, so equipment makers, browser industry, you know, the, the coding people, um, you know, and then the policy, you know, the policy issues also, because unless there is a will also from the countries to talk about um, to, to bring content in languages that people understand, it won't happen, you know. In a lot of um, countries where, you know, um, in my region, you know, in, the Af in, in Africa, for example, a lot of the content that we have right now is only in um, uh, what we call um, official languages. Those official languages are not accessible, even though the information is there. They're not accessible to the guy who is, you know, um, was not literate, so he would he still wouldn't know. Though the information is available, he still wouldn't know how to go get ask for you know my birth certificate because everything is written in the language that is not really reachable to him. You know, so these are all in a nutshell. You know, going from the um, the IP addresses all the way to the policy issues. This is really some of the things that we're working on, not only at um, you know, uh, the technical level, but really involving, uh, you know, the local communities and working with um, anywhere from uh, uh, the education people. We have funds that um, help research and education, for example, you know, to uh, one of the awards that we will give tomorrow, for example, is a public medical journal online, you know, which is really absolutely fantastic. But again, it, it is in 
only English right now, for example. So we need to make the effort to render that information in many more languages that will be accessible to even more people, uh, anywhere from uh, you know the disadvantaged to the youth to women to you know the professionals who really want to go in there but uh, are literate in other languages. Um, so I'll stop here and then we can have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much to you all for your presentation. And I would like to ask um, participants in the workshops, do you have any questions for the people on the floor regarding their presentations? And could you please quickly introduce <coughs> yourself? Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm uh, Troy Adelaine. I'm here. A very, it's a very interesting question in the sense that uh, especially I, I go to many developing countries. What I found that is not just about the internet infrastructure, it's about the ecosystem to develop applications, contents, and innovations are not there. Let me explain a little bit. If you are in the United States, in Europe, you have brilliant ideas, then automatically, very easy, to fund angel fund, seed fund, and then there will be companies guide you, bringing your concept into a commercial product. And because most people have credit cards, so then your service can post on App Store or Android Market, and then very easily sell through nationwide. But in developing countries, 
First of all, the angel fund the seeding fund may not be easy to find. Secondly, no one give you a technical environment to uh, develop the product. Thirdly, there's no uh, commercial guidance helping you to bring concept into a product. And lastly, you will find difficult that because people don't use credit card, then where is your distribution channel? How do you collect the money? So these ecosystems are not there, which hinder the local contents, the local applications, the local innovations. So the way I, I look at it is um, uh, there are ways uh, different people can coordinate. Uh, one of the key uh, player that I, I have in mind is actually the telecom operators, especially the leading operators in those countries. If you think of it, what they have is they definitely know how to do business. So bringing product commercialized. Secondly, they have the technical environment. Thirdly, because they have the payment building relationship with customers, so they are easy to distribute the service and collect the money back. But what is that to the commercial world? What does that mean? Uh, that is actually a very good opportunity for operator to, instead of developing service contents themselves, they can, by putting some seeding fund, they get the ownership and control of such applications and services. And they can promote their innovation image to the society and to the target customers they like. So it's actually a real, real win-win uh, situation. Uh, I think that that is one way to crack it. Uh, instead of just uh, just say we promote local content, we need to find a framework, a rule of games that makes the commercial uh, companies have incentive to do, and that also stimulate uh, local innovations, contents, and applications. system approach is, is the best approach. I think that, that there are lots of pitfalls with the whole you know, local content or the lack of local content or locally useful content or content um, in local languages is one of those very obvious development problems that I think is often solved in the wrong way or in a way that's not sustainable. I do think it is important for, for, for governments to create incentives to stimulate uh, the production of content. But I think it needs to be done at an ecosystem level. So, for example, to make sure that there's a, that that public education um, um, planning and systems and 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 you know everyone from teachers to to, to the ones that develop um, strategies um, are able to understand the, the the potential of the internet in supporting content flows. Um, it's also important for governments to make information about public services and. Um, available on the internet and in local languages. But I, I think that the notion that you can solve this problem by governments creating content or even NGOs creating content is not always sustainable because the world of information is so fluid and so dynamic and and it's not always easy to, to, to create the content that people really want and to know that, the, that that's the content that they really want. But public institutions definitely need to take responsibility for making content available in local languages. But I think in addition, I think the one point you might not have made is user-generated content. And I think what we see on the internet at the moment is this explosion of user-generated content and applications. And I think that's where, at your eco ecosystem level, um, human development is extremely important. Um, to not assume just that people are illiterate, but also to make sure that there are initiatives that address that. And the other thing that's extremely important is freedom of information, freedom of, inf of, of communication, an environment where people feel they can create and, 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 share, um, and, and share content effectively. And again, infrastructure. I think that's one of the things, you know, the, 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 the graph that you showed in your report of the growing broadband gap is an extremely disturbing, that, that is a very disturbing trend because user-generated content, user-generated applications, processes that have shaped the internet into what it is today really do depend on broadband. And if you don't have broadband in developing countries, you have a knowledge gap and a content creation gap growing. So I think, so in answer to your, your question, I think it's important to address it, but not as, at a simplistic level by just creating content from the top down in local languages. Um, th 
they said it all, but I think I'm going to um, add one more thing, which is that for me, there's at least one part that is a top-down content that can still be created by governments. This is about the e-citizenship stuff, okay? This is about have, uh, getting my, my, my birth certificate online. You know, this is one thing that my government can, can do for me. This is, um, you know, utilities in general, you know, in all countries are something that are still state, uh, you know, either sponsored or, you know, owned. So uh, if I can pay my bill online, if I can pay, uh, you know, my water and electricity bill online, that would be perfect. Uh, ask for my passport online. Um, you know, uh, wh when you think about um, data that is all of for, you know, e-health. Okay, anywhere from uh, correlating people's information all the way to making the information accessible is something that governments can still do. E-education, you know, curricula available online, uh, you know, pushing people to, you know, learn local languages. I was on another panel talking about IDNs, as I said, and one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, my region is doing is that, yeah, well, for the longest time, we haven't been... Re we haven't used, you know, local languages. Um, we went all the way to having the ministerial, African Education Ministerial, saying that dual track education should be a standard. This is one of the things that should happen. That content should be available, you know, for kids, for uh, adult literacy, you know. So this is part of the content that I think still has, uh, you know, some valid um, top-down uh, uh, um, uh, interest and is part of the policies that you know governments can put in place to make that happen Willie? Uh, very happy to to join in this conversation regarding uh, innovation uh, particularly with uh, local applications I think what we are seeing is that uh, particularly with the Android uh, developments that have come in lots of young people are seeing an incredible opportunity low barriers to entry in terms of developing location specific uh, applications in local languages or even in the official languages but are oriented to particular times and places. Uh, one of the things that we have been looking at is agriculture uh, in our own work and one of the main recommendations that we are making to government is there's a lot of information that is inside the government that they are having trouble getting to the farmers. We are saying get it out with the APIs so that these young people can have the raw material to work with. Now, of course, there are some sort of conditions to this. For example, if the buses don't actually run on time, there's no point in giving the government timetables out because you know you do applications based on irrelevant or, or unreal timetables. You're not going to get something of much value. But at least where there is useful information, I think it would be very useful to get the government information out with the API so that they can use it. Uh, one point I want to to refer back to the report, since everybody seems to uh, come back to it, this so-called mobile broadband gap. Uh, everybody relies on the ITU for this information. We have been engaging with the ITU for the last two years about how they can improve the quality of their data. I would caution you that this particular number that they are reporting is highly problematic. The internet user number that they are reporting is not worth the paper is written on uh, for most countries. Uh, just to give you an example, in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan, the ratio between internet users and internet subscribers is 1 to 500. And in Burundi, which is a country very much in similar circumstances, the multiplier that is arbitrarily applied to the number of subscribers is 13. Uh, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. They don't know how to count mobile broadband numbers, and they are not admitting it. So you're getting an undercount in some cases and an overcount in other cases. It's sad that since it comes out of a UN agency, everybody takes it seriously.
what you think should be developed, what is not already in place, what kind of policies should be developed. And um, I um, would invite um, Rowan and Leslie um, to focus in infrastructure policy. Um, and um, Thierry and Riette and, and Rachel to focus on the application layer and also to um, policies in other areas. So do we have what kind of other policies there, for instance, education, um, finance, etc., would have to be developed at the same time than current, uh, pure ICT policies? Um, who wants to start? Rowan? The uh, basic issue is that uh, wired solutions are not going to be very effective in most of the countries that we work in. They may be effective, as Wesley correctly said, in particular highly uh, densely uh, populated particular places. But the general rule that we are talking about is that in the developed countries and in the city centers, people will be reaching the internet across a few meters of wireless. And in the rest of our countries, they'll be reaching the internet across a few kilometers of wireless. So uh, one of the most important things is getting the frequencies, getting the spectrum story right. You heard the minister from Afghanistan say that they had issued 3G licenses. Now I would invite you to travel through India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and in none of these countries you're going to get a 3G signal. Even though India has issued 3G licenses, you're not going to get a 3G signal because it has been so delayed and so tied up in various kinds of bureaucratic malfunctions that 3G is not available. I'm talking to people in Papua New Guinea, they're talking about making 4G available. But in Thailand, which is a major player in Southeast Asia, the 3G licenses just occurred last month and they are going to be tied up in court for a few more months. So. That is extremely important that we make that uh, make the frequencies available because that's the basic raw material for most of our people. That's the way they will we, they will come in either on mobile devices or on dongles that are attached to uh, to uh, computers. Even in telecenters in our part of the world, people are using dongles to connect to the mobile because there's more competition and there's more play uh, in coming through that door. I'm not saying anybody should decree that it should be the case, but that's the reality. Uh, the fixed wireless solutions that people had great hope in are not really playing out too well uh, right now. The bottom line is we need to have low price points and a budget model, what we call a budget telecom network model. That is what connected our people to voice. That is what will connect our people to data. So that is, I think, the highest priority and around that we have to get around this whole debate about licensing and exit market entry and market exit rules uh, talking corruption 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 all the time isn't going to get our people connected we need to get this straightened out so market entry and spectrum would be my highest priorities if I were to have a five minutes of my minister's time thank you Uh, from infrastructure perspective, uh, when we talk to uh, different government bodies, uh, uh, what we found the common things are uh, first uh, uh, in the policy: how is the guarantee of universal service uh, execute? So that protects the the interests of all stakeholders in terms of large projects. When we talk about national broadband projects. Each country typically can only support one or two such infrastructure because we want to minimize the investment in terms of uh, minimizing the duplications. So if, uh, if someone is building such a network, how can we ensure that uh, uh, either rich or poor people or walks of life can enjoy such service? So universal coverage and penetration guarantee is one of the key issue. The other is um, because such network only have one or two, so fair competition and uh, access rule and also pricing is very important. On one hand, we want this network to support 
all service providers, all telecom operators, all uh, participants in the value chain to be able to utilize this network. On the other hand, we also need to protect someone who do the investment into this single network because uh, if the price, if you ask all the ones who want to use it, they will say cheap price. But then who invest, take years to invest into such a huge uh, project, they also want uh, investment protection. So the rules should clearly say how to let other people to use it and, as other, uh, and on the other hand, uh, how to protect such investment. Uh, the third thing is that typically such project will involve uh, investment incentive. Because as I said, uh, the benefit of such uh, uh, improvement in internet penetration not just benefit any single commercial companies, but also stimulate job creations, GDP, health, education. So we see many governments, they try to put incentive in terms of tax incentive, in terms of low interest rate, um, uh, loan, sometimes they participate in some of the funding. So this will stimulate uh, the incentive uh, for people to invest in. Uh, the last part is uh, government set up the rules for uh, uh, stimulating the ecosystem establishment. Uh, uh, as many of the participants and also myself, I recognize that uh, NGOs and governments are not very creative and innovative when we talk about services. So it's better to set up rules to uh, stimulate, to uh, encourage uh, 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 innovations and local contents and local service in building up this ecosystem. So these are the key areas. And um, uh, and as from Huawei, we are no longer just selling phones and selling boxes. We are providing advisories to uh, govern bodies in this area. So um, so these are the key areas that we face and we are asked by many of the ministers in different countries. to continue on the application layer? Sure. So many governments have invested a tremendous amount of resources in e-government services and promoting their government transparency and accountability, but they haven't invested in anything in the uptake on those services. So I would actually challenge governments to examine the partnerships they have with a variety of institutions and enable an environment that allows those partnerships to expand and those partnerships to receive support, both financial and infrastructure, to help the government achieve its goals. Right now, there's a lot of money that is, to be honest, being a little wasted because the information is not being used in the way that it could. So I, that's where I would challenge the government, is to start thinking more creatively about their partnerships, look at institutions that already exist, and make sure those institutions can have access to the resources that help the government meet its priorities. I really support what, what, what Siri is saying. I think uh, you know, maybe what I would, I would uh, say to the minister is to um, sit down in a room with other ministers, <laughs> in fact, to get the whole cabinet together, and, and to really think seriously about where does information and communication fit into the national vision for, for social, human, and economic development. I, I still encounter that that uh, so many governments that don't have a comprehensive vision um, for that, they would invest in establishing call centers, for example, and see that as a driver for for revenue generation and and, and, and job creation. But they they wouldn't look at what are the resources that that the education system needs to to flourish and 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 function well. I think serious example is an excellent example. There's so much money going into e-government and not enough money going into good government. And I think that's the other thing I would say to the minister, uh, and that is that um, innovation in, in, um, in, in, in service delivery um, is not a substitute for really citizen-oriented, people-centered citizen, uh, service delivery. And, and, I, and I think governance, uh, governance needs to be stronger and sounder and more robust and there needs to be more transparency and accountability. So I think that's also very important. I think institutions, I think that's the other thing. I think often um, governments tend to, once they get the idea that ICTs and innovation for development is an important area, they tend to look for 
pilot projects or showcase projects that they can invest in instead of really investing at the institutional layer at an infrastructure where there are intermediaries and where and where where uh, investment can can have a spin-off effect i think libraries are a very important part and i don't think they have to be paper-based libraries ron um, but but places where people can come for learning and innovation and sharing i think universities i think having research institutions think tanks um, and i think that's very important often ministers don't you know they look for something quick or something where foreign direct investment you know can be can, can attractively be be drawn in and then i think finally i would and i think siri, uh, siri also touched that and and wesley is um that it has to be multi-stakeholder i think i think uh, uh Governments cannot tackle this alone. Um, I think when they do, they often do it do it badly. Um, and I think uh, having partnerships with, with with business, with civil society, also doing research, you know, having uh, assessment and channeling the learning of that into how ongoing development um, takes place, I think is also all extremely. Thanks, Verena. Um, I think I'm going to throw a few flowers at OECD first. Um, I would like to say we, uh, we really will be very happy to work on the global interconnection thing that uh, we were talking about following the study on um, you know, internet exchange point. We've seen the value of that in, uh, we have seen you know, several regions being very interested in that, in that, that study. Um, we also have seen in another study that we conducted together the relationship between local content, internet development, and access prices. It's a study that is available actually right now on the Internet Society website, and it's really, it, it illustrates a lot. So I would like to also encourage the OECD to go out of their regular, uh, uh, you know, uh, clan and uh, basically to broaden its partnership yes, outside of the OECD economies to ensure cooperation and development. And in doing so, I mean, uh, one of the things that um, I would advocate for our, um, uh, uh, our, our community is really the, um, uh, the take up and uh, appropriation of this new protocol without which there won't be any internet, you know, IPv6, which is one of the reasons also why we've been working with the government to show them that, yeah, the, the one internet that we have right now has rich capacity. You know, um, if we stay on V4, there won't be any more development. So we need to make sure that interconnection happens, that networks talk to each other, um, and any new services that will come absolutely need that new protocol to flourish. So that's, that's really something that I think we can work together and make sure that um, uh, infrastructure is in place, and uh, hopefully, as Henriette, Siri, and others said, um, if the content and uh, you know holistic thinking can happen, you know, locally, we might end up with um, yeah, um, social economic development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we close this workshop, is there one or are there two last questions from the floor to the panelists? Chango APC. Um, what the previous round? Previous rounds, I was uh, this issue of uh, user-generated content, and realized that actually it follows very well uh, through the second round of discussion because uh, one of the issues that I encounter when the opportunity to talk to people about those problems is, uh, is that a problem of uh, uh, the culture of information. We talk about information society, which will be at the basis of anything else information, but not me or whatever. And I realized that actually a lot of people, I mean, there's, there's a, a, a lack of um, approach to information, a lack of understanding of information as, as an asset information as, as a technical or technological artifact, how to curate information, how to develop information, how to, how to uh, manage information, how to categorize information so that it can be quickly available for people who actually need the information to, to create words or to create any value, any uh, 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 added value. I 
research in the in research in actually in the in a, in a uh, research related to fiction. And there was a lady once who was telling me for information from uh, some of his her colleagues. And when she went to that place to get the information, which was published uh, in the print, printed materials, she was handed the material at the right page that information was with uh, uh, the other person holding a paper to hide the rest of the pages so that she only get the information that she uh, expressly asked for so and I'm about a country where I mean I'm talking about Ghana Ghana of all places now is a country where uh, economic growth has been uh, praised to be uh, very advanced this uh, couple of years. So uh, what will happen if I find myself in charge, for example? If that can happen in research centers in Ghana, in Accra, imagine where we are. What needs to be done to bring that information culture, the, the, the understanding that information needs to be disseminated, information needs to be shared. need to be done. Have you given any thought of that kind of thing? What kind of, what kind of we need to put in place to change that uh, situation? Thank you. Terry, do you have a very quick answer to that question? Well, I think you raise a really important challenge that we all are facing with, and uh, we don't have enough time to go into all of it, but I would say it's a cultural shift, and it's a cultural shift at many levels. At the government level, so there needs to be a government attitude that information is free and accessible and open to all. But then at the individual knowledge worker level, so either the librarian or the research information service provider, to say whatever you are coming in to, to ask for should be available to you. And where we are seeing that shift happen in places where it has been more challenging, it's revolutionary. But I would also argue that there are many institutions where individuals, and I'm going to cite librarians again, that is their core mission. Their value is to provide information that is free and accessible, and it's why we're such a proponent of libraries, because that cultural shift has already happened. So do we have one last question from the floor? No, this is not. Yeah, please. Yeah, I heard it. So in fact, this report is brand new. So we presented it to our uh, member countries two weeks ago. Um, but we hope that it will be available on the web page in three or four weeks. So this is www.oecd.org slash STI slash ICT. And otherwise, just um, write me an email. You can always contact me. I welcome your comments and suggestions at um, varina.weaver at oecd.org. You'll find my name in the IGF program. And Not too bad. So the name is spelled right here. Uh, on your right side, there's a screen. Yeah, or there. So. Um. <laughs> okay. Um, I would like to, to thank all the panelists um, for this very interesting discussion. Um, and I, of course, would also like um, to thank you for participating um, in this, what I thought was a very interesting